one of the unique one of the unique findings uh, showed a significant relationship between sea level rise and increasing the enterococcus loadings over time. In response, we were looking to better understand and characterize these particular conditions. Now, increasing sea levels have been observed all over the world, but some of these impacts can be particularly enhanced in Texas. Sea level changes are impacting Texas infrastructure, wastewater treatment plants, and their infrastructure, as well as septic system operations, stormwater infrastructure, roads, beaches, dunes, et cetera. Today's presentation is one component of our 2022 series shedding light on these factors and how they intersect with non-point source pollution topics. Today, we're super excited to have two speakers from NOAA joining us today to discuss sea level rise, Doug and Kristen. Douglas Marcy is a coastal hazard specialist at NOAA at NOAA Office for Coastal Management in Charleston, South Carolina. He's been with NOAA for 20 years working on flood and sea level rise geospatial mapping projects, storm surge assessments, and coastal hazards assessment projects, contributing to more disaster resilient communities. Kristen Ransom, who will be speaking after Doug, is a regional coastal management specialist with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management and is based in New Orleans. Kristen works closely with the state coastal management programs, such as Texas, and National Estuarine Research Reserves in the region and works on issues including coastal community resilience, sand and sediment planning, and public access. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Doug to get us started. Doug? All right, thank you. Uh, I will apologize in advance uh, that I have a little bit of uh, background noise going on today because I've got some construction going on. So hopefully you can't hear that. I've got to share my screen here in just a second. Uh, actually, it says it says it's disabled. I can't. You need to may, maybe make me a presenter. Yep. There we go. Okay. Everyone, see that now? Yes. You can hear. You can hear me. Okay. I'll try to speak up if there's too much background noise. But I really appreciate you inviting us to speak today. Uh, we're going to tag team this. Um, I'm going to talk to you first about a little bit about uh, kind of climate change on uh, at the global level, what's leading to and causing sea level to rise globally, some of the physics, kind of 101 physics behind sea level rise and how that, and eventually kind of drill down to local impacts on the Texas coast. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some tools and trainings that we offer through the NOAA Digital Coast. And, uh, and then Kristen's gonna talk to you about some local efforts in Texas that are using the sea level rise information. Okay, uh, I'm gonna borrow some slides here from uh, the Natural Climate Assessment. Um, the Natural Climate Assessment is a assessment that the executive branch has to basically produce a technical document, a sort of the state of the climate science to, the, to Congress every four or five years as part of the uh, Global Research Act. And um, the last one was put out in 2018. And we're gonna be going through another uh, Natural Climate Assessment starting soon. And then we'll come out probably in 2023. And so it's basically going to be an update of the science. But what you see here is all these different indicators showing us that climate is indeed changing, um, temperatures going up. Uh, we're having more heat waves. We're having more heavy precipitation. We're having, uh, they say the, the wetter areas are going to get wetter and the drier areas even drier. Arctic sea ice uh, depleting and, um, and sea level is also going up. And so you can see all the indicators that for the most part, a lot of these are going up and some are actually going down, but this is showing us that it really, some of these are happening in our lifetime, especially when we talk about sea level rise. What's contributing to this is the warming of the planet. And that's due to basically CO2 gas acts like a blanket, a greenhouse gas that, that insulates, um, doesn't allow as much heat to escape from the atmosphere. And this is a cycle that has happened over the last 800,000 years, but um, about every 100,000 years, but you can see now that we're way above where we have ever been. Uh, and, and that was in 2017, we're above 400 parts per million. And that's contributing to both land temperature increasing and sea temperature increasing. So the ocean is actually absorbing a lot of the heat. And we'll talk a little bit about what, why that's important for sea level rise. 
historically sea levels gone up and down as well even before humans were on on the earth um, and we go through these periods uh, again uh, ups and downs every hundred thousand years or so but you can see that we've we had a, the last rise uh, from the, the glacial period um, and then sea level was pretty static for about four or five thousand years until the late 1800s when it started to increase again right around the time of the um, industrial revolution then you look at out in the future what we try to the through the ipcc internet international uh, panel of climate change with uh, global climate models try to model different greenhouse gas scenarios into the future with these curves and you can see the temperature there is a squiggly line ob observed and as you go out for three different scenarios one 8.5 being we're not going to do anything and it's going to continue to to uh, increase the temperature based on the increase in co2 and then there's a leveling off it's 4.5 and a, and kind of a best case scenario 2.6 which you can see we're already kind of above that at this point so as i mentioned the temperature is a big component um that's causing sea level to change but there's others as well the main component for global sea level rise so far has been as the ocean has warmed, it will expand. Any liquid that warms will expand. Um, there's obviously uh, contributions as well from land-based ice. The, light, the ice, like the sea ice that's floating already, well, once it melts, doesn't really, it's already displaced in that water. So it's not gonna increase. It's the land-based ice as that ice melts, uh, it's gonna contribute to the overall volume and the, uh, lack of, of mass uh, from the ice sheets as they melt is going to redistribute the water, the ocean on the planet. And then locally, you have things like ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream and um, decadal oscillation, El Nino, things like that can cause local sea level rise differences, as well as, especially in places like in Texas and Louisiana, sub local subsidence, and that's causing sea level to rise faster in some locations versus the globe. And then a little bit of terrestrial riverine um, uh, runoff as well, but not as much of a factor. So in 2017, right before the, the uh, National Climate Assessment, the fourth one came out, this tech report was put out and they're actually working on another one that's gonna come out soon, I'll, I'll mention at the end here. But it was a series of scenarios, every half meter, um, going out to 2100, and they corresponded to these RCPs, these re, uh, representative concentration pathways, which are greenhouse gas scenarios. Uh, and so you can see the box here, when I drew this red box, is sort of the, the, the more likely range uh, globally between intermediate low and intermediate high, which corresponds to about a meter of sea level rise by 2100, sort of right down the middle there. And the greatest uncertainty as you go out towards 2100, um, let's say past 30 years from now, a lot of the projections are pretty close together and they, they, they get farther apart. And that's based on the uncertainty mostly of, of how fast the ice sheets are going to melt. We've seen most of the global uh, sea level rise right now from expansion of the ocean and, and a lot and some from Greenland, a lot less from glaciers and Antarctica. And as this goes into the future, the the pace at which uh, Greenland melts versus uh, Antarctica will also determine how uh, which regions are going to see more sea level rise. The farther away you are from the glaciers, the ice sheets, the higher the sea level is going to be. So we are closer up in the northeast, for instance, to Greenland. So we're going to have less impacts in the long run. Um, now, if Antarctica also contributes a lot, that's going to uh, tip the scales a little bit, as you can tell, um, this is a very uncertain science as we study the ice sheets even more. They used to be pretty stable and we didn't really worry about them. And now that they're obviously a big con contributor, we are studying them a lot. Also sea level rise, uh, at any given moment, sea level is not static or flat. Um, you can see the different parts of the, of the world, it's stacking up on one side or the other, like the East Pacific has been going on for like 10 or so years. And this goes back and forth with some of the decadal oscillations and, and the trade winds pushing um, the water across the ocean. And so we have to take those things into account, not just global sea level rise, we have to adjust that regionally based on oceanographic factors, gravity changes as the ice melts, as I mentioned, it's called ice, ice sheet fingerprinting. 
So the farther away you are, the, the ice sheets are actually holding water close to them because of the mass. And once that mass is redistributed, the water is going to start to, to fall away from the ice sheets. And that's going to contribute as well. And then vertical land motion. So these scenarios are available for the whole country. Um, they're in a one degree grid, as you can see here. And then they're also available at the individual tide gauges that we use in, in NOAA uh, as part of the National Water Level Observation Network. And as I mentioned, land motion makes a, plays a big part. So you can see this map of the US and um, I don't have uh, Alaska and Hawaii on here, but you can see that, that the sea level is indeed rising at different rates, depending on where you're located. So the Gulf has uh, in Texas and, and Louisiana has a lot of uh, increase compared to the rest of the country, higher rates. And that's mostly due to vertical land motion. So this is just a way to, another way to look at that. Uh, the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and, and so we have a different rate. And then actually, if you go up into Alaska, sea level is falling because of the uh, tectonic uplift going on. So the land's actually rising faster than sea level. So zooming in locally, this is the Rockport, Texas tide gauge. And you can see we've had a, a gauge there intermittently all the way back till uh, about 1938 or nine. Um, and you can basically draw a regression line through that uh, best fit. You can see it goes up and down. There are cycles of higher and lower. It's kind of a squiggly mess. But when you do the extrapolation there, you can see that we've had about 1.92 feet in the last 100 years. So this is definitely occurring. Um, and what we're starting to see is uh, this is for all you, if you remember from your math classes, uh, one is a straight line there, the um, sort of the green, the linear trend, as I showed you on the last slide. And then the other is more of a quadratic. So you see in that the, the record's actually starting to follow more of a curve. And that's exactly what the projections show are starting to happen and will happen. So the rate is going to increase. And this is going to impact everything. Um, on the ground, um, we use uh, tidal datums. One is, uh, and I'll mention this, is mean high, high water. And that's basically the average high tides. Um, we've kind of built up to that point at, along the coast. And that's going to change, it's going to increase. I mean, how high water will actually go up the next time. We just finished an epic in 2001, a tidal epic every 19 years. The moon goes through a, uh, a declination. In other words, it's a little bit farther and closer to the sun during that period. We, we monitor that for 19 years and come up with an average. And so there are places when sea level rise uh, rates go higher, we're going to have to update a lot more than just every 19 years. Louisiana is one place where they updated every, I think, 10 years or, or maybe even five years because of some of the subsidence rates are so high. So in a community, what do you do with all these different scenarios? I'll give you an example. This is Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they have a sea level strategy where they looked out to about 50 years out, uh, almost to 2070 now, and then looked at a two and a three foot increase. And you see that range there right along the intermediate curve of, of the ones I just showed you. So that's about like the middle more likely range as I showed you from the RCPs. So that's one way to do it. And they also wanna, we'll go back and relook at that every five or so years. And the new science changes, they may change their, their, um, their guidance. One of the things that is, is really starting to uh, be another indicator here is the high tide flooding is increasing twice as frequently as it was in 2000. And this is basically, High tides caused by uh, what is a normal process, what we call a perigee and tide, where the, the moon is, and the, is lined up with the sun um, and pulls the tide bulge higher or larger. So we have higher tides. Um, a lot of times it's in the spring and in the fall. And that's starting to impact areas. And we've been doing um, counting these events with our sister office, uh, the Tides and Currents. And, and basically trying to do projections of how many more flood days we're gonna have and, and also mapping that. So you see these minor, moderate and major zones here and areas that will start to be impacted in the future almost, almost every high tide. And what does that mean? This is an example of Port Isabel. You've seen the number of events has increased dramatically even in the last 10 or so years. And if we extrapolate out with these different sea level scenarios, you can see we're gonna have hundreds uh, in the hundreds of, of tides uh, per year. Excuse me, my uh, phone just went off. Sorry about that. Okay. And at the coast, we have an issue of 
you already have extreme rainfall events as we know, but because the stormwater systems are linked to the outfalls, for instance, in, in a estuary or a bay, what, what can happen is that back backs up into the, the um, pipe network and the water can't drain out as fast. So it's important to look at this um, relationship between what's going on in the, at the coast with the estuary and salt water and the fresh water and a lot of stormwater systems were not designed to handle that change in, in sea level rise. We also get asked a lot about hurricane activity. That's gonna obviously still continue to happen. Um, so sea level is gonna be on the background, increasing the water levels, but we're still gonna have storms. We will probably have more intense storms because of the higher water temperature, especially at depth. And that's going to make future storms worse. So the current floodplain as mapped, uh, let's say by FEMA, 1%, that's going to change over the time. So that 1% is eventually gonna become the 10%, uh, happen a lot more likely and that floodplain is gonna basically move inland and it's, uh, impact a lot more people. So a little bit about the next climate assessment, as I mentioned, is gonna be coming out in 2023. A new report actually is gonna be released here in the next month. And that is going to have some updates to the sea level projections globally and regionally. And there's gonna be some information from NASA in there which is an extrapolated trend from 1970 out to 2050 to give us an idea of where we're headed and how likely, uh, you know, where's that gonna stack up on the projections and then more information on, on extreme water levels. And what we wanna do is eventually try to produce products that allow you to get information, not just at the tide gauges, but like gridded, like you saw there, uh, anywhere in between. So if you happen to live in between the tide gauges, you can still get an answer, so. This is uh, Kristen and I at our desk every day. What are we gonna do? This all sounds so negative, uh, but we do have some solutions. And uh, one of the, the projects I work on is a, called the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. You just Google Sea Level Rise, I put the URL there. It's kind of a screening level tool. We use nationally consistent information, including the best available elevation data we can come up with. Uh, a lot of times that's shared with state, by states with us. Um, all the data can be downloaded, map services, uh, and we've been doing a ton of updates of that every time there's new elevation data. And all the projections I just mentioned um, and the new ones will be in there too as soon as the, the report comes out. So you'll be able to compare the 2017 to the 2022 projections. We also have the sea level rise information into another tool called the Coastal Flood Exposure Mapper. And this is kind of a neat tool, it allows you to look at each of the coastal hazards, uh, the flood hazards individually. As you can see there, the high tide flooding, FEMA flood zones, um, hurricane center, uh, storm surge risk maps. And then we also have a composite layer that shows you kind of the combined impact of all of those. If you click any, at, it, at any location in there in the red, it tells you how many of those hazards you will be potentially exposed to. Uh, we just put out a new uh, topics page called Coastal Inundation. We have a lot of different topics pages, so you can go get a ton of information about all these uh, references I was just talking about, National Climate Assessment, our Sea Level Rise Viewer, all that is available on this page. And we also do, uh, for more technical folks, we do a two-day inundation mapping course that kind of goes through the, how we do all of our sea level rise mapping from the DEMs all the way to producing inundation layers. We haven't been able to train this because it's in person two day uh, requires uh, a GIS lab. But if you're interested, there's Matt Pendleton. He's kind of in charge of the class. We also have a good training. That's a one day course on um, seven best practices for risk communication training. And that's another one that you can access through Digital Coast. All right, and uh, that's it for me. I'm going to hand it now over to Kristen and give you some uh, local examples of uh, how folks are using some of this data. Thank you so much, Doug. And I see the comment here in the chat to share the map viewer links. So Doug, maybe while I'm, I'm talking, if you wanna drop the links to the tools that you just mentioned in the chat, that would be really helpful. They're also linked on the presentation, which I believe Jason and Brian will send out to everyone following the meeting. So um, also want to echo um, Doug's thanks for, for having us on to speak with you. I have the very distinct pleasure of getting to work out in our regions. Um, and so I, um, in addition to the other states that I work with, work very closely with the Texas Coastal Management Program, which is um, run by the Texas General Land Office. 
And so what I want to talk about a little bit today are some of the examples where NOAA funding or Texas Coastal Management Program funding, which comes through NOAA, has helped sort of either helped communities use some of the sea level rise data that Doug just walked through to do some vulnerability planning um, or other ways that you can take the, the knowledge and the data coming out um, related to sea level rise and um, sort of use it to address the, the issues in your own individual communities or areas of work. And so you saw in the slides um, a lot of data pulled for Rockport, Texas, and Jason mentioned at the top that they are a great partner um the the city of rockport has been doing resilience and recovery planning for a really long time and they are a really fantastic example of the benefits of doing planning and vulnerability assessments early and often so um the the city of of rockport has been partnering with a number of communities or, or a number of organizations across the gulf including texas sea grant texas target communities um the Gulf of Mexico Alliance Community Resilience Team and others to do vulnerability assessment and planning um, and just to understand sort of how the community um, would react to things like um, storm surge, sea level rise flooding, as well as where some of their infrastructure needs are. Um, and then, as we're all familiar, Harvey um, impacted the city of Rockport quite significantly. Um, but you can also see um, that having some of those plans in place really, really helped the community once it came time to um, plan for and access resources for recovery. Um, so a lot of that early vulnerability assessment that they worked on um, helped put them um, or helped uh, with the recovery post Harvey. So Doug, next slide. And one of the groups that NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, specifically in the Gulf region, is currently working with is the Texas Community Resilience Collaborative. Uh, this is a partnership between Texas Sea Grant and Texas Target Communities, both programs run out of Texas A&M University. And they're coming together to essentially provide resilience and hazards planning resources for coastal communities in Texas. Um, they are currently with some OCM funding developing a new and revised community planning atlas, which is a tool that incorporates the sea level rise data that we talked about, plus a ton of other data layers um, that is a, built for and aimed at helping communities at the start of their resilience planning. And so if that sounds like you and you'd be interested in utilizing some of their tools, we know that they have a couple of workshops coming up in the near future to work with some communities that are at the start of their resilience planning journey um, and they want to utilize the tools to help you along with that. So again, there's a link here on the slide. Feel free to visit that um, if you're interested in those resources. So some of the area, other areas that OCM is supportive of um, various activities is in natural and nature-based infrastructure. Um, what you're seeing here is a project called Exploration Green in Houston, and this is um, essentially an old abandoned golf course that was turned into an urban wetland nature park um, that also acts as a retention area for floodwaters. And so um, the, the Texas Coastal Management Program, among a number of other partners, um, helped contribute to the implementation of Exploration Green. And this has been a really fantastic example of how essentially using nature natural nature based sometimes referred to as green infrastructure techniques can help mitigate multiple issues like stormwater flooding um, as well as provide other um, benefits like tons of athletic fields parklands trails and it's just a really beautiful place to be all right so next slide i um, want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that the texas coastal management program supports um, research related to the impacts of things like sea level rise and other human activities on um, coastal non-point um, source pollution, as well as other impacts. So every year, the Texas Coastal Management Program does the Coastal Management Program grants. And every year, there are a number of research grants that are awarded to um, state universities in, um, in Texas to continue understanding what those really local impacts and interactions are um, with respect to sea level rise and um, stormwater flooding and coastal nut point. And then finally, the last thing I'd like to mention, so next slide please, is the Texas Coastal Resiliency Master Plan. 
This is again a huge statewide effort run out of the General Land Office and um, this particular program is using the most up to date sea level rise modeling um, land cover modeling and doing some just incredible science to really understand the state of the sea level rise and what uh, sea level rise impacts on the coast and what can be done at the state level um, and what projects can be implemented to help mitigate a lot of those effects and so I know you on the line are probably already um, up to with the development of the coastal resiliency master plan or participate on the technical advisory committee but I would urge all um, if you haven't been plugged into it stay plugged into the Texas clean coast because they are a huge part of that plan and um, we'll be able to keep you updated on its development because there's a, a new version coming out um, they're in the middle of developing that and so that that is it for me. I just wanted to share a couple of examples in the ways where both um, NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, as well as our the Texas Coastal Management Program, are helping to support addressing some of these localized impacts from sea level rise. So I'll stop there and open it or hand it back over to Jason for questions. Thank you, Kristen, and and thank you, Doug. Uh, Kristen, you, you've been a great friend to Texas and a great liaison. Uh, with the Coastal Management Program and NOAA, so thank you for that. And and Doug, um, I'm still trying to digest some of the things that you said in your presentation. Uh, do appreciate that, and and I know that you you uh, you broke the presentation down from probably something that uh, could have been much longer in in its length. And so with that, some details were were not included. And one thing that you mentioned is still kind of uh, ringing with me is in reference, and I, let me see if I caught this correctly, you said that almost two feet, I think it was around 1.9 feet of increase in sea level in Texas in the last 100 years. Is, is that what you said? I was wondering if you could just expand on that a, a tad bit. Uh, yeah, that is, well, that was at that one particular tide gauge um, in Rockport, but Galveston's similar. The, if you look at that map, maybe I can go back on my slides. Uh, you can see here that all of the Texas coast, if at least all yellow arrows, and this is in millimeters per year or feet per century. So yellow is one to two, um, almost two to three up there in, in near Houston. So, um, and that kind of bleeds into Louisiana too. So yeah, that is, um, Again, if you think of global sea level, it's going to is a certain rate. If you average all the tide gauges around the world and use satellite altimetry, that's how we measure global sea level over time. Altimetry was started collecting in 1993, and we've had gauges going back to the 1800s. So um, then you have to break down and see what's going on locally. And there's a lot of factors, and one of them is vertical land motion, some of its currents, um, but mostly in the Gulf there, you, you see the difference between, um, you know, right there between Louisiana, once you go over to Florida, you don't see as much of the, of the land subsidence. Did that answer your question? It, yes, it did. And thank you. And, and, and you, sorry. Yes, you did. And, and thank you. Um, you. You bounced around a topic related to maybe to relative sea level rise. Um, and, and we do have a question that might touch on that. And I'd like to ask Brian uh, to please uh, help us with the, the questions asked in the chat. And just as a reminder, if you do have questions for the speakers to please place them in chat and uh, Brian will start moving through those. Brian? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Doug and Kristen for coming here today and you know, going over this topic with us. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of great questions from uh, the chat, and I'll just apologize in advance for any names that I butcher, so I'll probably just be going with first names to keep it safe, uh, but Lee starts off with a good question. Uh, it says, do you expect local subsidence on the Texas host to continue at the same rate until 2021 and beyond? Yeah, so one of the factors when we look at the sea level projections is uh, one of the contrib contributions is vertical land motion. And because we don't know, we, it's, it's actually a data set that it, we, it's fairly poor nationwide in terms of us knowing how fast the ground is sinking 
or going up. Um, we do have information at these gauges, but we don't have like a gridded, uh, we're starting to use satellite data to, to do that. NASA has been working on that. But we assume one rate, we, we get that from the tide gauges because we go back and survey those in all the time. Uh, we can see that's included in the trend. When I showed you that trend, that 1.92, you can actually go in there and, and figure out how much of that has been vertical land motion. And then the rate of vertical land motion is, is included in the projections, but it's a constant rate. So as you go out to 2100, it's assuming that every year you're gonna have the same amount of vertical land motion. So we don't know if that's gonna change. We don't know if the rates of vertical land motion uh, over time will, will increase. One thing I can say is that tectonic activity screws everything up. <laughs> uh, we had an example in American Samoa, which is one of our, within our um, jurisdiction, and they had an earthquake and that since the earthquake has had a major um, subsidence going on along certain parts of the coast and that's raised sea level trend quite a bit. Uh, to get to your question about what's causing it, there's a lot of debate. Uh, some of it's controversial. In the Gulf, there's a couple things going on naturally. Uh, that is uh, more, more so in Louisiana is the, uh, the weight of the amount of sediment coming down from the Mississippi River on the Delta out on the continental shelf is the weight of the sediment is actually pushing and deforming the crust. There's a lot of salt deposits under there. They're fairly soft, so that, that happens. Don't know if that's so much the case along the Texas coast, but certainly any kind of liquid or, or gas extraction, whether that's groundwater or oil, will also cause uh, subsidence. Anytime you pull water out of the, out of the substrate, it's going to dry and shrink <laughs> so that's that's also a factor all right well thank you for the detailed explanation uh and kind of following up on that since this is a semi uh, related question um from sj he goes rockport's groundwater is a little on the saltier side can you comp comment on the impact of increased groundwater utilization on the subsidence uh, in that area or just gen in general yeah, uh, in general, um, this is an issue that with sea level rise, um, we will start to see our coastal aquifers that would normally have been fresh start as the salt water rises, that's sort of a wedge that comes in. And if you think about fresh water is, is less dense than salt water, so it floats on top. This is particularly an issue in Florida, South Florida, because it's all carbonate. Um, limestone and so that water is floating on top of the salt water as it comes in it's going to increase the the height of the water table so the water table is going to be even more exposed to the surface so uh, that's going to cause drainage problems but it also impacts the, the freshwater wells that salt water wedge comes in all of a sudden that well starts to draw in salt and uh, the parts per million count goes up and it becomes non-drinkable um, and then of course the more there's local uh examples of, of pumping fresh water out of the, of the aquifers. One was in Hilton Head, South Carolina. There's another one, I think, in, um, in around the Norfolk area, the Chesapeake, because uh, they're actually doing another program. They took out so much water that they, just start, they thought that was causing local subsidence. And they're actually doing now injection wells where they're putting wastewater back into the ground to, to alleviate some of that issue. So yeah. Growing water extraction is that it can, can definitely lead to subsidence. All right, sounds like there's quite a few issues, uh, potential things going on there. Um, I'm gonna move on to a question from Mike. He said, how do the NOAA sea level rise projections compare with the latest IPCC 2021 projections and scenarios? Good question. Um, the IPCC six or AR, it's the, uh, assessment report six just came out. And actually it, it's good timing you asked that. And then at the last slide there I, that I showed, the, the new projections or updated projections are gonna be based on the AR6. They had to do a translation. Now, those are global projections on a global grid and we have, to, we have to kind of fine tune those to the regional grid that we're put, putting out and at the tide gauges too. So that report's gonna come out, I think on February 15th and it'll be based on AR6. Uh, 
All right, sounds good. Uh, filtering through a lot of questions coming in, uh, some of which um, we will uh, kind of, we'll go through as many of them as we can. Um, skip a few down back to uh, subsidence along the Texas coast from Bob is, is this subsidence uh, attributable largely due to water wells, oil production, damming rivers, with resultant loss of sediment renourishment or some other uh, cause? I would say uh, probably all of the above. Okay. <laughs> and Kristen's saying yes too. So yeah. <laughs> and and which is which is causing more? Uh, that's a that's a good question. That's a that's a really hard thing to 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 figure out and measure. Like like I said, regional subsidence is not something we're, we've got a really good data set on, honestly. So we have to rely on the survey networks that we have around the country, and they're mostly just at point locations. So. Um, until we start using better information satellite data, for instance, and start to compare that over time, then you can maybe get a better idea of bridging the gaps on those points. Um, and this may be a question for follow up or maybe a question for uh, Kristen or Jason is what happens when the cost of bulkhead repairs and shoreline protection exceed the, the ability of, you know, an individual owner of that land? So I can take this from sort of a, a larger perspective, and and I think the first the first thing I'll say is that's a really hard issue, and it's not you know sort of universally solvable. One of the things I will mention is that as we have seen a lot of um, the the funding opportunities go out and the, the projects that we support, we have seen a very clear movement from wanting to do a lot of vulnerability assessment and planning work to needing to actually make those infrastructure changes. And so we're starting to see sort of generally more money come down for things like actual infrastructure. Um, we have supported a number of different projects through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, National Coastal Resilience Fund. Um, so these are natural and nature based infrastructure projects. And so there's the availability for things like living shorelines and shoreline stabilization through that program. Um, the coastal management program grants often um, are eligible for some of the smaller scale type projects so there's an opportunity there and so there are there are programs and where that are available and where they are we have a vested interest and have been putting resources into helping communities connect into those funding opportunities as well as developing um, resources to help them apply for them so i know one big funding opportunity that a lot of folks are paying attention to is fema's um, brick funding so this is the building resilient infrastructure and communities funding it's a massive pot of money and very often there are um, economic analysis requirements and benefit cost analysis and things like that. So we have some internal teams here that are developing resources to help communities um, navigate those processes as well. And so you can visit our website coast.noaa.gov, um, specifically head on over to the digital coast and all of those resources that we've developed and information about how to get specific targeted technical assistance can be found there. Sounds great. Did you have, did you have a comment, Jason? That was a great explanation, Kristen, and thanks for the specific references. Um, obviously, constructing anything on the shoreline is, is uh, very complicated and can be very costly. Uh, one initiative of the Coastal Management Program is the Living Shorelines uh, Program. And so they've, uh, they've launched, uh, excuse me, launched uh, some resources here Recently, uh, there is a website available to help you direct to some of that. Maybe we can get the link posted in just a second. Um, but that there are also components of that initiative to try to reduce the cost and some of the permitting and uh, survey costs associated with that, uh, trying to respond to some of the issues expressed uh, by stakeholders. Brian. Thank you. Uh, Want to mention Philip's question of how soon will the sea level impact the whooping crane habitat in Aransas Wildlife Refuge? I do not believe anyone on this call uh, will be able to give you a, a satisfactory explanation. And I would recommend reaching out to uh, the, the wildlife refuge themselves. They may be better able to speak on that. Um, this, is, this is Kristen, I will say, I can't answer the question about how soon, but I do know that 
the majority concern on, I, I think, on the Aransas refuge um, from sea level rises around sort of loss of habitat, which, you know, the refuge is in a really great place to sort of help mitigate that. So I know it's something they're looking at. All right, thanks for a little bit of clarification on that. A lot of uh, our, I uh, just would add that uh, the National Estuarine Research Reserves and within NOAA are, are really a, where we're doing a lot of uh, looking at sea level rise, local sea level rise impacts on, on a natural system. So they're great sort of sci outdoor scientific uh, laboratories. And uh, there's a lot of research money that's been, been spent on that question. We have a whole component of, of our office with an ocean service that does uh, end costs. They do a lot of, uh, of grants to, to uh, universities too to study that type of stuff. Got one more question that just uh, popped up. And this may be uh, one Jason or Crystal knows. Is TPWD involved in any way? Uh, for example, Goose Island uh, State Park would appear to be very vulnerable to sea rise. Are they, are they doing anything in there? They are. I will have to um, call on any of my other uh, coastal management program folks on the line who might know more specifics than I do. I'm, I'm reaching back into my memory, but we have funded several projects out at Goose Island State Park. I can't remember if they were specifically addressing sea level rise, but um, I know Goose Island is an area that TBWD is paying a lot of attention to and looking for resources to, to help manage. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and one last final note here. Uh, see a question in chat from uh, Salt Masters. Um, and this is, this is another one that I, I do not believe we are equipped to handle today. And it may be best to uh, reach out to someone in the county, but is Noah making any comments or you know, um, dealing with the, the LNG and SpaceX situation down in Cameron County and the permitting applications, groundwater extraction risk? Um, that is, I would reach out more locally as they would be the people who could pass that information along to you. Uh, I do not believe that anyone here uh, would be able to give you uh, an answer that you know, is satisfactory covering that topic. Um, let's see a few more things popping in here. And uh, Gina is asking, are there maps that show projected sea level rise on the Texas coast that are zoomed in to show the impact at a more local level? And I want to speak and say, I believe on all those sea level rise viewers and everything, you do have the ability to zoom in once you're, you know, click on those links, you can, you can move around and it gives you a little bit more ability to play at a local level. Um, okay, yeah, uh, just kind of, uh, yeah, put just that put in that there. in there. And you can turn the background off. If you're not familiar with looking at satellite imagery as the backdrop, you can change the base map to a street view uh, that gives, and even in the, the coastal flood exposure mapper, that's another tool that I think was put in there. Um, you can zoom in one more level on the sea level rise data too, and, and turn on the street maps. In some cases, we'll have uh, building footprints on it. Ryan, are there any other questions? Yeah, I'm just uh, reading one more that popped in from uh, John, and it's um, talking about the, the type of sediment that is compacting uh, Louisiana and causing their subsidence. Uh, and the location of our gauges tend to be in the bay, which are known to contain those thicker sediments. Uh, uh, and so is the GLO in recognition of this um, and, you know, have there, you know, been similar records, uh, and I believe this may be, uh, better to reach out to somebody, but, uh, Jason, you may know better who to reach out to on something like this. Yeah, it's a good question. And if this is, uh, the John Anderson, uh, it's a great, great question and input there. Um, a quick answer is I don't have an answer to this. And 
nor do I have a specific person that I could put forth right now to identify. Um, but I, I will do some nosing around and I'm not sure if, if John wants to hear back from that person or not. Uh, if you put that in chat, we can do that after, after the meeting. And John, I will say this is Kristen. Again, I want to make mention of some of the work going on at our National Estuarine Research Reserve site in Texas. That's over in Port Aransas. It's Mission Aransas for those of you that are familiar. They are doing a lot of sea level rise assessments. Again, it's very based, um, but they are doing some work. Um, they are one of our sentinel sites. And so they are doing a lot of assessment of sea level rise impacts on things like vegetation. So again, more research to essentially just complement the data sets that we do have. Thank you for that, Kristen. Wow, so it, I think it's very clear right now that we could easily spend uh, all day, all week, all month uh, unpacking the nuances and the details and the science kind of bringing us up to this understanding. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Kristen and Doug, uh, both of you for sharing your time and expertise with us in this group. And uh, we're, definitely it's been an infusion of information to take us into the series here. In Texas, some of the ways that we've been working and hearing uh, from different constituents uh, in the Clean Coast Texas program is related to infiltration and inundation, uh, both to stormwater as well as wastewater treatment systems. And one of Doug's slides kind of hinted at that, and that's one of the, the areas in particular um, that we are interested in as we are potentially seeing some connectivity with uh, decreases in water quality. Uh, some of the other presenters, we, we have two confirmed right now uh, that will be talking with us uh, later down the line at future Lunch and Learns, which typically take place around the third Thursday of each month, give or take. Um, we have uh, Catherine Hageman from Miami-Dade County, um, who will be talking with us about some of their successes and challenges in that particular area and how they've been responding to sea level rise and infrastructure issues, as well as Javier um, Guerrero with uh, the Lower Rio Grande Valley Task Force is going to talk with us about uh, keeping a large watershed focused effort ongoing for uh, over two, two decades at this point. I'd like to thank our partners, Texas State University's Meadows Center for Water and the Environment for facilitating this event, and Ms. Adriana Mendez for helping to host it as well. I'd like to thank our other collaborative partners with Clean Coast Texas, Texas Sea Grant, as well as Texas Community Watershed Partners for their assistance and help. And without any further ado, thank you all so much. Have a great day.